Thank you, James. Let's turn it over to uh, Rupert. Big shoes to uh, follow in. Nice job, James. Um, I, too, wish to thank uh, Project 2049. Randy and Mark, you're doing a great job. You really are. Um, building and running an organization such as the one that you've conceived um, and raising money, a constant process, even in an, uh, a challenging environment like this, um, is tough. And you're doing it uh, extremely well um, while continuing to look for ways to add value to what we're talking about, not do things that other people are doing to people who are doing the same thing, but to find niche areas where Project 2049 can plug itself in and add something to the debate. I think you're doing that, and uh, that's, that's terrific. I'd also like to um, echo uh, Pete's comment about missing Harvey. I, w I wish he was here. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I get to talk about the economic side of uh, this dynamic, this bilateral relationship, this trilateral relationship. Please don't go to sleep. Um, it's incredibly dynamic. Um, I won't barrage you with statistics and data, or maybe just a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, we have basically spent the bulk of this afternoon talking about the defense and security relationship. And to some degree, we've interwoven the politics of those issues because the TRA, um, the, the TRE deals so fundamentally with the security relationship between the United States and Taiwan. And uh, by extension, our, our relationship with the Chinese broadly and, and, and in, in a military and security sense as well. But the economic relationship is fundamental to America's relationship with Taiwan. It is very much an aspect of the glue that binds us together. And indeed, not surprisingly, it's very much part of the glue that binds the triangular relationship, the triumvirate that exists between the US, Taiwan, and China. I, I can't think of another part of the world in which we're so economically vested as that triangular relationship, and yet we have the sort of security challenges that we do as a country in our relationship between Taiwan and China. But the TRA, um, a gentleman asked at the end of the uh, last session whether or not the TRA will be around in 30 years. Who can tell? That's a great question. Um, but I, 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 I honestly would suggest that it's impossible to, uh, to answer that question. But, you know, with, with the fact that two of the entities at play, the two of the countries at play, um, are democracies and one is not. Um, you've just got so much change, so many dynamics at play there. Who knows what relevancy the TRA will have? I do know the TRA is going to have relevancy this year, next year. Um, but beyond that, um, we, we can only hope to continue to focus in on the Taiwan Relations Act as the basis and foundation for our relationship because it's stable, because it's ambiguous enough to allow us flexibility to do the things that we do as, the, as those dynamics change. Okay, you brace yourself, we're gonna get into numbers. All right. Um, the TRA has played a critical role in Taiwan's emergence as a leading global economy. Um, you know, I, I was thinking as I was, I was doing my notes, um, what other relationship the United States has or is part of, uh, what other alliance that the United States is part of, in which security is such an overt part of the language of that relationship. I, I, the only one I could really come up with is NATO, um, where there's such a clear link between the security interests of our country and, and, and the economic interdependence between the parties involved. And the TRA clearly states or clearly pulls out for us the fact that the security relationship between the two and the economic independence between the two are very much uh, intertwined. Um, the, TR the TRA has played a critical role in Taiwan's emergence as a leading global economy and a critical trading partner to the, to the United States, raising the welfare of both our own people, both uh, uh, the peoples of the United States as well as the people of Taiwan. Um, just to pull a little language out, where, whenever the laws of the United States refer to or relate to foreign countries, nations, states, governments, or similar entities, such terms shall include and such laws shall apply with respect to Taiwan. This language, uh, language such as this, helps ensure that this, when the switch in recognition took place, it did not change the fundamental economic dynamics at work in the US-Taiwan relationship. This is absolutely key. And it's, in, in fairness, it's already been touched on, I'll bet, in a different area today, that the TRA allowed for a smooth transition between recognition and non-recognition in a way in which fundamental um, value-added benefits to both sides were allowed to continue and to grow, economics being the issue here. Um, 
Two things I would cite as, as, as examples. One, after the switch in, rec in recognition, the US continued granting Taiwan MFN status. Um, also, the US continued Taiwan's inclusion in the generalized system of preferences. Um, tariff, it's, that's unilateral tariff production, if, if, uh, if you track this sort of stuff. Um, China, ECFA. Joe got into it, others have, have, uh, have, have touched on it. Um, I'll get into it a bit more. The Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, the central tenant of M President Ma's policies at the moment is this economic agreement. I happen to agree with you, Joe. I think that the notion of an ECFA has come before the analysis necessary to understand fully what sort of impact it's going to have on Taiwan. That said, certainly from the US Taiwan Business Council standpoint, in the short term, we think it's a good idea, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, you hear a great deal, or certainly I do, maybe others do, that China is now Taiwan's most important trading partner, its largest trading partner. And I want to debunk that a little bit to sort of build a case later on in, in, in my comments. Um, and here come the numbers. Um, the switch in recognition, uh, w w with the switch in recognition, Taiwan exports to the US have jumped from approximately 10 billion to an ex to in excess of 60 billion, a, a two-way trade. And while China surpassed America as Taiwan's top export market several years ago, please note that while Taiwan exports 38% of its goods to China, approximately 50% of those goods are for assembly and reshipped out of China. If you make an adjustment for this dynamic, Taiwan's exports for the China market indeed fall to 19% of overall exports, with 46% of the goods exported out of China reshipped to G3 countries. That's uh, the US, EU, and Japan. Taiwan's total exports to G G3 would then be greater than 40%, twice the, ex twice the size of exports to China. G3 demand remains the dominant driver for Taiwan's export growth, and the US sits at the top of that list. So I, I understand fundamentally the unique nature of the issues that Taiwan and China experience. But what you also have is, is the fact that China increasingly has become the world's manufacturing base. And you just, you just can't get away from that. And you just can't get away from the fact that Taiwan is the world's leading uh, supply chain manager. And the forces that drive globalization are such that Taiwan Taiwan is, is literally forced to continue to look for ways to ensure its competitiveness, to root out costs, and therefore to find ways to reduce, um, uh, re reduce those costs in its relationship with, with, uh, with China. And, and, and that really brings us into the, into the ECFA. Um, security, defense and economics are an extra inextricably intertwined. I sort of touched on that. Most economies are massive net consumers of US global security. That security guarantees the integrity and security of supply chains, which all trading nations consume, some more than others, I might add, um, uh, and some more than others, based on their trading volumes and the amount they spend contributing to security. I would argue that countries like the UK and France uh, sit much higher on that list than countries such as Germany, which exports much and contributes extremely little to global, global security. Taiwan is an interesting exception. It would surely take on a far greater role if its unusual sovereign circumstances didn't make it difficult to develop a robust security capability, as well as find friends and allies willing to allow Taiwan to project it in meaningful ways. I think Randy, uh, Dan Blumenthal, others have done some extreme, Mark Stokes, here you go, Mark. Have done some uh, extremely interesting work in innovative ways in which Taiwan can assist in projecting security in innovative ways. But the fact of the matter is that if Taiwan was a, a, a recognized country in the, in, the, in the regular sense of the world, it would be doing considerably more it, 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 as well as in the, uh, in the security environment. Um, the TRA, having, however, encapsulates in a manner rarely seen, other than NATO membership, as I mentioned, the inexorable link between security and economic prosperity. This is a fundamental point about the past value of the TRA, and in my view, its continued future is the basis of US-Taiwan relations. Those, those things are very much intertwined. Looking forward, um, economic issues anyway. Um, We've had, we had the arms freeze, let's call it what it was. Um, it was a freeze, um, it was arbitrary, um, it was wrong. Um, I wanted to ask Pete and Shirley, and maybe we'll get an opportunity after this to, you know, in the, in, in the absence of removing the, um, the annual arms sales and the fact that clearly, while noble in intent, um, the 
dealing with it, with dealing with Taiwan arms sales in a regular sense, you have uh, an exact, you had an executive branch who gamed the system, and you have those who reflexively oppose it. Issues arise. So how do you move forward? Do you go back to the way it was, or do you try and rejigger what we were using uh, under most of President Bush's uh, two terms? 